Knights, whose name is unknown, allegedly cut down the Ottoman Sultan. No! No! Little Al Kosovo 1389 Barbadian reacts. After the disastrous defeat at Maritza in 1371, the Serbian Empire was left without its most powerful nobles. Vukashin Marnjevcevic and his brother Ugiesa were killed, and only a few- Wait, 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 is this a series? Is this a series? Interesting. If this is a series, let me know. A few months later, the last Serbian Emperor, Uros V, the weak, passed away without an heir. This effectively put an end to the Nemanjic dynasty that held the reins of power for over two centuries. The realm disintegrated as the local lords carved out their own territories within the boundaries of the fallen empire. The Christian domains in the region were now in a difficult position. Fragmented, none had the strength to hold off the Ottoman armies. But, although Sultan Murad I could have defeated his neighbors one by one, he knew that controlling the newly conquered areas would not be easy and could provoke a potential creation of an anti-Ottoman coalition. So the Sultan decided on a different strategy. Instead of seizing lands of the defeated forces, he offered peace to the Dianovic noble family in exchange for vassalship. A similar strategy was executed in Bulgaria, which was threatened the most by the Ottomans, but also Byzantium, which could only find safety behind the walls of Constantinople. Dude, holy crap. Look, look, I didn't even realize that was Byzantium. Oh my goodness, man. Damn, that downfall is so freaking crazy. Why couldn't Byzantium recover? I want someone to explain that to me. But anyway, let's keep going. Being further west, Prince Marco, the son of the dead king Vukashin, probably did not become an Ottoman vassal immediately after the defeat at Maritza. But having lost much of his troops in the battle, he was no longer able to stop nearby Serbian nobles from seizing his territories. To stay in power, he was eventually forced to recognize Ottoman suzerainty. With this, Sultan Murad secured peace in the Balkans, and had significantly expanded the Ottoman sphere of influence. At the same time, he used the annual tribute paid by the Christian vassals to finance preparations for future campaigns and establish strongholds that would serve as staging points for spreading Islam further into Europe. But how were the Ottomans able to even, like, develop, you know, develop into a force that was able to, like, threaten you know what I mean? Like, because the Ottomans seem small here. Like, they seem, like, equal to everyone else. Like, how in the world were they able to, like, exert such force, man? You know what I mean? Wow. At the expense of the freaking Eastern Roman Empire, too. Because these were all Eastern Roman Empire territories, weren't they? Oh, my. Wow. While there was peace in the Balkans, Prince Lazar emerged from the ruins of the Serbian Empire as the most powerful nobleman. He used the fall of the Mrnjavtovic family after the Battle of Maritza to consolidate his position. His ally and son-in-law, Vuk Brankovic, took Skopje from Prince Marko, the former capital of the Serbian Empire. Then, in autumn of 1370... Yo, Serbian Empire, bro. Serbian history, very interesting to me. I love Serbian history. Got to learn more about it. That's why I'm reacting to this, actually. Um, I like Russian history as well. Very interesting to me as well. Bulgarian history. Yeah, Bulgarian history is very interesting to me as well. I, I Yeah, definitely. Definitely, too. Yeah, those three. I got to learn more about those. Lazar banded together with the Bosnian band Tvrtko and a Hungarian nobleman, Nicholas Garay, to form a coalition against his rival, Prince Nikola Altamanovich. 
Outnumbered and attacked from all sides, Nicola's dominion was conquered and divided between the three allies. And in 1379, the area of Branachevo in the north also fell to the ambitious Lazar. Wow. Okay, Moravian Serbia. Are we going to see a uh, resurgence of a Serbian empire? Is that what I'm about to see here? These expansions strengthened Lazar's tax base and manpower, while the newly acquired mineral wealth financed recruitment of more troops. Soon enough, Lazar deemed himself the ruler of all Serbian lands, openly claiming the right over all remnants of the former Serbian Empire. Okay, Laza or Lazar. Oh my gosh, I hate these names. Oh my, these names, dude. Oh my gosh. To the west, the Bosnian band Vrko was also on the rise, and in 1377, he was crowned as king of the Serbs and Bosnia in the Milicevo Monastery, thus also showing ambition to unite all Serbian lands into one powerful kingdom. Wait, but Bosnian, aren't Bosnian people like different from Serbian people? What? What? I'm confused. I don't know. I don't know much about like, um, this region's history. You know what I mean? That's why I'm learning about it. You know, uh, I want to educate myself more about it, fam. Despite the conflicting ambitions, both Lazar and Tvertko remained faithful allies, ignoring their disagreements, guided exclusively by real politic. Ah, skip this part. While the Balkan states were dealing with their problems, Sultan Murad renewed his offensive. In 1380, Small Ottoman contingents regularly ventured into Christian territory, primarily to plunder, disrupt the enemy's economy, and implant fear among the population, but also to scout rival armies. Bulgaria suffered the brunt of these raids, especially in the area south of Balkan Mountains. One such incursion took place in the summer of 1381, when an Ottoman... Wait a minute. But these are vassals, right? So why is he raiding his own vassals? What? 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 I'm like actually confused. Why is he raiding his own vassal? Ottoman detachment broke through so deeply into the Bulgarian lands that they crossed into the territory of the Serbian prince, Lazar. However, Lazar's voivodes were quick to react and managed to defeat the Turks in the Battle of Dubrovnica. Okay, Serbia. Okay, okay. Oh, hey. I see you. Okay. The Ottoman offensive did not stop here. With a new attack in 1383, the Turks occupied Ceres, one of the most important cities in Macedonia. And two years later, Sofia was conquered. Damn, bro. Look at the... Oh, look at the Eastern Roman Empire. Wow. The way to Serbia was now open, and indeed in 1386, a strong Ottoman army attacked, taking the important city of Nish, from where they proceeded towards Lazar's capital, Khrushchev. But Lazar intercepted and dealt a heavy defeat on the Ottomans in the Battle of Plochnik. Damn, 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 damn! Lazar, okay, Serbia! Okay, Serbia. Okay. I see you, Serbia. Damn. The Turks withdrew from Serbia, but kept hold of Nish. In Wait, why couldn't he take it back? What? Why couldn't he take it back? Was his forces like too weak or something? Bridged by the Christian victory, Emperor Ivan Shishman of Bulgaria stopped paying tribute and sending troops to serve under the Sultan. However, the Turks responded by invading Bulgaria with a huge army. Come on, Bulgaria. You should at least, like, freaking ally to Serbia or something. I don't know, make a coalition or something. Conquering numerous cities and forcing Ivan to again become a vassal. 
on the Aegean coast in 1387, Thessaloniki, the second largest city in Byzantium, fell into Turkish hands. Damn! Oof! In the summer of 1388, a new detachment led by the Ottoman commander Lala Shahin Pasha set out for the Serbian lords. Without attacking Ottoman vassals Marko and Konstantine Dijanovic, Shahin Pasha probably marched through Kosovo to attack the Kingdom of Bosnia. However, under the command of Voivode Vladko Vukovic, the Bosnians inflicted a decisive defeat on the Ottomans. Damn! The Ottomans just can't beat the Serbs and Bosnians, man. They're steamrolling everyone else, but the Serbs and Bosnians, they're putting up a fight. All right. The commander, Lala Shahin Pasha, barely escaped with his life from Bosnia. Damn. Damn. Okay, Bosnia. I see you. I see you, Bosnia. Okay, you can throw hands. Okay. It was then that Sultan Murad realized that these incursions were not enough to destroy the economy and bring chaos within Lazar's domain. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 These these guys are putting up a fight. <laughs> like down. They're 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 stubborn. I don't even know the word, but like Damn, they're crazy. Although small, the so called Moravian Serbia was economically strong and militarily well organized. Thus, Murad began preparations for a major military campaign to defeat Prince Lazar. Thousands were recruited from both the European and Asian parts of the Sultanate. In 1389, with his two sons Yakub Chalebi and Bayezid, Murad set out to settle accounts with the Serbs. Learning of Murad's plans, Lazar called upon his ally, Vertko. Although busy. Oh, so the Bosnians and Serbs were allies. Oh, that's so cursed. That is so cursed when you think about it. Bosnians and Serbians being allies, what the heck? Is he fighting on the Dalmatian coast? The Bosnian king sent a strong detachment under the command of Vlatko Vukovic, who had experience in fighting the Ottomans. Lazar's son-in-law, the master of Kosovo, Vuk Brankovic, also prepared for war. Very small detachments of knights from the surrounding Christian countries, such as Hungary, Bulgaria, Albania, Croatia, and Wallachia, may have come to Lazar's aid, who tried to gather as large a coalition as possible. But his primary concern was maintaining a precarious peace with Hungary, where not too long ago he meddled in the Hungarian civil war, against King Sigismund. Join large skip, skip. scale battles with military vehicles. The online action game War Thunder has received a major with his, with his army, army gathered, gathered Lazar Lazar marched off to meet the Ottomans. Meanwhile, Sultan Murad passed through the territory of his Serbian vassal, Konstantin Dijanovic, and advanced to meet Lazar. Okay, he's zooming into the battle. Oof. This is okay. Okay, you know when he zooms in, that's when it, that's when it gets crazy. On June fifteenth, thirteen eighty nine, the opposing forces stood facing each other on the field of Kosovo. In the first ranks of the Ottoman army, the Sultan positioned his archers. Behind them was a strong line of infantry, which consisted mostly of Azebs. I like the fact that he has a black bird right here. I like that. I like that. That's the reference to the black bird from Kosovo. Uh, yeah. I know something about that. I don't know too much about it. If you want to tell me in the comments, you can tell me. But that's cool. Love that reference. Further back were the Akinji light cavalry and the Sipahi heavy cavalry. The Sultan's sons, Yakub and Bayezid, commanded the left and right wing, respectively. Murad was stationed in the center, accompanied by a detachment of Janissaries, who served as his personal guard. 
Across the battlefield, Lazar's army was mostly made up of heavy cavalry, the main fighting force in most European countries at the time. Cavalry was placed in the front rows, with probably some lighter cavalry units next to them. Behind them stood the infantry. Lazar commanded the center of the army, with Bosnian voivode Vladko Vukovic at the head of the left wing, and Vuk Brankovic commanding the right. Sources are conflicting on the size of the two armies. However, it is likely that the Ottomans had a numerical advantage with 30,000 troops, especially in the infantry arm, while Lazar's smaller force of 20,000 troops were better equipped. Lazar's plan was to strike and disperse the enemy formation, knowing that the psychological pressure created by the charge of his heavy cavalry would test the resolve of the Ottoman troops. However, Muir going on the offensive when you're outnumbered. Ooh, that's interesting. Brad expected this and arrayed his army in a defensive formation. Oh, damn. How did he know that? He planned to use his archers in the opening stage. While they could not inflict much damage on the heavy cavalry, their arrow volleys could provoke the enemy into an unorganized charge. Rows of spikes were placed to slow down the advancing enemy formations. Come on, dude. Did he not notice the spikes? What? Fam, how did he not notice the spike? Laza, how did you not notice the spikes? If that was me, I didn't notice the spike. I don't know, maybe I'm using hindsight. But freaking... I would not go with that plan if I saw the freaking spikes, man. After first contact, the Ottoman infantry would then bear the brunt of the Serbian cavalry charge. Once Lazar's attack lost momentum, the Sultan would launch a general counterattack. Artillery opened the engagement, but the shots fell well short of their intended targets. Shortly afterwards, Ottoman archers stepped forward. They unleashed on the Serbian knights, who waited for the signal of their commanders. Lazar ordered the charge of his entire cavalry. The thudding of thousands of European knights steamed towards the Ottoman line. Prince Lazar himself took part in the action, as well as the commanders of the left and right wings. The Ottomans probably expected that the first phase of the battle would be the most difficult. And indeed, the Serbian charge inflicted heavy losses on Murad's army. The Serbian left wing and center had some success. Okay, Serbia. Serbia, Serbia strong. Okay. In driving back the Turks. But the greatest progress was on the right wing, commanded by Vuk Brankovic. His charge was so effective that the enemy's infantry could not stop his advance. You're at Damn! Damn, steamroll, man! That, that's the definition of rolled over! As left wing, under the command of his son, Yakub, gradually started to bend and retreat. The Serbs were so superior on this part of the front that they broke through to the Ottoman camp. Damn! Yeah, Lee! I know I'm saying, like, damn so much, but oof. What else am I supposed to say? Like, they're, I mean, they're better equipped, but still they're outnumbered, right? And the Ottomans knew of their plan. Bro, imagine knowing of someone's plan, right? And you still lose. That's like cheating, like trying to cheat on a test and still failing. Like, that's so embarrassing. This was the critical moment of the battle. And most sources agree on the course of the battle only up to this point. We will rely on the correspondence that arose immediately after the battle between the Bosnian king Tvrtko and the administration of the city of Florence. It said that a group of Serbian knights broke through the Ottoman ranks and hacked their way towards Murad's tent, which was surrounded by camels. In the melee, one of the knights, whose name is unknown, allegedly cut down the Ottoman sultan. No! No! Yo! He died? The Sultan died? 
Oof! Damn! Meanwhile, the situation on the front improved for the Turks. The endangered Ottoman left wing received reinforcements and managed to stabilize the situation, while the right wing, despite the losses, stopped the advance of the Bosnians. Then, Bayezid brought his cavalry into the fight and started a counteroffensive against Vladko Vukovic. If it is true that Murad died during the battle, as some sources claim, and that Bayezid took control of the entire army, it is truly astonishing how the Ottomans managed to maintain discipline. What? They... Alright, Ottomans. Okay, Turks, I see you. I gotta give credit where credit is due, man. I thought the whole alliance was just about to like completely like crumble. Usually, like when the emperor or leader or general or whoever is, you know, commanding the fight, usually whenever they get killed, like everyone usually just scrambles away. You know what I mean? And even go on the counteroffensive. Vlatko Vukovic then began to lose control of his troops, which gradually withdrew. In the end, the entire Serbian left wing fled the field. The defeat on the left wing threatened Lazar's left flank, which remained completely unprotected. Bayezid's troops quickly seized on this opportunity and rushed against the Serbian center. Damn, um, bro. Realizing the situation, Vuk Brankovic most likely saw that the battle was lost and initiated an organized withdrawal from the battlefield. Lazar, probably unable to carry out his own retreat in an organized manner, either fell in battle or was captured and decapitated. Oh, wow. That's awful. That is awful. Daddy, oh no. Dad, I didn't want him to die. I liked this guy. Damn. That's actually so freaking awful, man. According to most Ottoman sources, the death of Sultan Murad took place while his troops were scattered and while they were chasing the Serbian army. Allegedly, the Sultan found himself alone momentarily, which was used by a Christian warrior who pretended to be dead, to kill the Sultan as he walked by. The most common version in the Western world is that a Serbian knight came to surrender, but when he was brought before Murad, he drew a dagger and killed the Sultan. Basta. Basta. Based. I have a clear bias, if you don't know. <laughs> I think it's obvious that I have a clear bias. The name of the knight remained unknown, but over time he was named Milos Obelic and became a symbol of courage and resistance in Serbian tradition. Due to contradictory sources, historians cannot determine the time of the Sultan's death. But whenever Murad met his end, his son Yakub was killed soon after by his brother Bayezid. In his by his brother? What? His bid to become the new Sultan. That is crazy. Holy crap. After the battle, Sultan Bayezid retreated from the field of Kosovo to consolidate power and prevent potential rebellions. News spread throughout Europe about Sultan Murad's death and that the Ottoman campaign against the Christians was stopped. This news was mostly spread by the Bosnian king Tvrtko, and indeed from his perspective, the Battle of Kosovo was a great victory especially since most of his forces returned safely to Bosnia. But for Moravian Serbia, the battle had catastrophic consequences. With Lazar's death, his wife Milica took power, because their son Stefan Lazarevic was still a minor. Their powerful army was destroyed and would take some time to recover. Although the Ottomans did not continue their campaign after the battle, in the autumn of 1389, the Hungarians invaded Serbia from the north, ravaging large areas and besieging smaller cities. Unable to resist them, Princess Milica was forced to accept the suzerainty of Sultan Bayezid and had sent her youngest daughter to his harem as a pledge of peace between the Lazarevich family and the Ottoman Empire. 
I'm on hungry. Oh, come on. Hungry. <sighs> Why? Come on. They protected you from Ottoman invasion. Because let's be real, the Ottomans are uh, almost freaking like wiped hungry off the map. And this is what you do? Oh, come on. On the other hand, Vuk Brankovic, having preserved much of his troops, continued to resist the Ottomans until his death. To this day, there is disagreement among historians about who was victorious in the Battle of Kosovo. The reason for this dispute is the death of both rulers, which has not happened often in history. Those who claim that the battle was a Serbian victory base their argument that the advance of the Turks was temporarily stopped. Those who consider it an Ottoman victory do so because the Ottoman army prevailed on the battlefield. In any case, by defeating Lazar's coalition, the Ottomans broke the strongest resistance in the Balkans, and as early as 1390, they resumed their campaigns, primarily aiding their Serbian vassals in their fight against Hungary. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. That was a good one. That was a good one. I definitely have to react to more of History Marsh. That was a good one. Definitely got to learn more about freaking Balkan history. Oh my goodness. If you have any other stuff that you want me to react to, oh my gosh, let me know because that was so freaking good, man. Man, check out these videos that are appearing on your screen right now. If you like my reactions, make sure to like, man. Like, like, like it. It takes one second. Maybe subscribe. If you don't want to subscribe, don't subscribe. Yo, man, thanks for watching.